my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Carlos Cesar from the State University of Campinas in Brazil, speaking about uh, biophotonics. Uh, it's a pleasure to come here, and I'd like to thank for organizers to invite me. And I want to talk to you about the ideas of integrate lots of photonic microscopy. And when I say integrate, it means you have to use them in the same instrument at the same time. If you, don't, if you cannot use at the same time, if you have to use it in different equipments, it's not integration. It's just done uh, in parallel. So the questions are, why do you want to use integration? And what are the techniques that you wanted to integrate together? And how can we provide this kind of integration? And then I'm going to give you an example. So for this first part, I want to come to this number three here and let the examples for the next one. A uh, little bit about Brazil. So I took this biograph from people that I'm showing here. All the countries in the world that has a population larger than 100 million people and an area larger than 4 million square kilometers and the GDP larger than 400 billion dollars a year. And if you take all this country, you end up the only four one in the world are Russia, United States, China and Brazil. Of course you have Australia and Canada with a huge territory but the population is pretty small. Is that work? So it seems that Brazil has to do something with this amount of territory and population and this GDP. You have only four countries in the world with uh, this, this kind of numbers. And I usually tell people that one nice trip to do when they come to Brazil is to go to, to visit the Iguazu Falls, but Iguazu is a shared moment between Argentina, Paraguay, and Brazil, and it seems that you guys are going to go there. So you are going to see all of this. So instead of that, let's move all the way to the northeast of Brazil. And you have wind and warm beaches over here. And if you look at this space here, to Google Earth, oh, first I'm going to show the city. Campinas is near São Paulo. São Paulo is a 12 million people city. Campinas is uh, only 1 million city here. It's about one and a half hours from São Paulo. And I'll invest. It's a state university of São Paulo called Unicamp. It's like, right there. And this is the picture you can see at the Google Earth. And this organization of the university is their logo as well. And if you're going to look at that, Side there, you're going to see with Google Earth, you're going to see something like 70 kilometers of something that looks like sand. And if you come close, you can see sand, and you can see some blue stuff here. And then, if you go closer and closer, you can see sweet water, swimming pools in this place called Lençóis Maranhenses. Maranhão is a state, and Lençóis is a bad shit. So the question is, uh, why do you want to do the integration? The question, and the, our answer is, we want to understand the cell process in time and space. So time is important as well. So you don't want to lose any information during the cell process, otherwise you have to start everything back again. And the process is a sequence of events in time, and so the time evolution is crucial to understand the process. And then you clear see that the tool we need is capable of real-time observations. So we don't want more pictures, we need movies now. And of course, in order to observe a process, you need a non-destructive tool, remote, capable to bring biochemical and biomechanical information, 
for you with spatial resolution at subcell level. The idea is, would be to go to molecular level, like Rafael was talking today, and capable to reconstruct image in three dimensions. So I wanted to resolve in time, in space, and spectrally. Uh, usually, the strategy to obtain a good signal to noise ratio is one is to increase the sample volume and to get to get better statistics, but then you want to lose resolution in space, and or increase the observation time, and then you want to lose temporal resolution. So there is a compromise between these two, and often is quite good because one molecule can kind of emit a thousand folds in one microsecond. One microsecond. If you take image of one microsecond per pixel, it takes you one second to get one megapixel images. And the biological process usually they last for millisecond to days. Okay, so sometimes you need to just take uh, time lapse image, but for 20 days or 10 days to follow up some cell process, and that's important. I will show you here a movie. That's an animation movie made by the University of Harvard showing the inner laugh of a cell. You just have to listen a little bit about this music here. And the idea is we shall be able to make not a move, not an animation out of this, but a real move inside some cells here. Everything in biology is not just by chance. Biology can use enzymes and can use special localized special molecules in order to make a substance and products in a much better performance than we are able to do with our chemical industry here. Anything we do, we have to increase the temperature all the way up to 500 degrees and biology can do everything like this, polymerize fibers, depolymerize fibers in room temperature. So if you learn how to do this, it is going to have not only impact on our health and our life, but we can make all sorts of different materials by using biological laws. It's there and it works. This guy here, this lysosome, is taking all the garbage out of the cells, just walking. And this uh, step of this walk was measured by optotweezers. So you can see that there is tons of different events and process happen just inside one cell. And so that's the idea, to go there and understand. You see that even this kind of chemical reactions, they are not left just by chance. You always have to increase the chance for it to happen. And that's the way that life had <coughs> evolved to do it in a very uh, efficient way. And so if you want to do this, you almost need to use optics. You, you almost do not have any other tools. Optics is a wave, so you always use wave to understand remote and non-destructive phenomena. And it's a wave with a wavelength that we can have spatial resolution at 200 nanometer level, uh, no contact without infection, and light has also chemical selectivity by just look at the vibration of the molecule. So we can uh, go into resonance with these vibrations and have a chemical selectivity for our image. And the uh, modern arsenal of photonic tools that we can have now, we have for manipulation and for biomechanical measurements, we have optotweezers. Uh, fluorescence is a very important one, it's very efficient. And we can have single and multi-photo confocal microscopy. We can have lifetime image, FLIM, energy transfer, correlation spectroscopy. And at the same time, we will have nonlinear optics with second and third of one generation. And we can do the spectroscopy with cars and ground. Uh, here, I don't know why it's not playing. That's a spermatozoid that's strapped in my optical tweezers. And we can take from the spectrum of any living uh, microorganism right there at the focal spot of the optotreasers. 
Uh, by 2009, we applied for the National Institute for Science and Technology. It was approved, and it was me and a bunch of biologists and medical doctors, and they told me that the idea was, I had to promise them that I would only buy user-friendly equipment. They look at my lab and say, I don't want this. Only you guys can work with that. Plus, hire a technician and do not punch any more holes at the microscopes. So we can buy the microscope, but we cannot destroy them. And make the system as commercial as possible. Uh, so they look at this and they said, we don't want to do this. That's just the microron with my optical freezer here. And they said, no, we want something that's closed in a box and you just have to uh, type at the computer to see what's happened. Uh, we got the money to build this new facility here, so the microscope is going to be there, and we're going to have an optical table. Uh, Mariana was a technician hired by the university here, and we're going to keep the biologists on that side of the table. So the biologists cannot go into this side of the table, so the only people that can arrive with can come to this side of the, the table. But, uh, the build is not ready yet, so all, everything is now being set up in my lab here. I promised them to not push a hole, but I already made one, just one, okay, right here. And so Marianne is here, right in front of the new Zeiss microscope that we bought. Uh, so let's start with the first techniques. The first one that brought me to this field, I learned with Arthur Ashen back in the lab in 1986. I came there in 1988, so I saw him doing this all sorts of tricks with software tweezing, and I said, oh, that's so beautiful, I want to play with that. So when I came back to Brazil in 1991, I started my own optical tweezer, homemade optical tweezer there. And just to tell you, just let's use uh, ray optics here. If you have a beam, a ray that's coming to this side here, and your bead here has a Hepatic index higher than the outside hepatic index, it's going to bend this way and then it's going to bend this other way when it's get out of the bead as well. And because it does transfer momentum, this ray changing to this direction is going to give this moment transfer to the bead. If you look at the other way, you're going to see the moment transfer to this side here. They will cancel out the, the horizontal and they will add up bringing the center of the particle to the focus of the laser. If you play around with just this simple idea, you're going to show if the particle is uh, up into the focus, the force is going to go down. If it's on the left or on the right, the force is always trying to bring the particle to the center of the focus. And that's a 3D trap. Uh, so you can trap in three dimensions here. And now I'm showing here just the light is changing here until the uh, center of the microsphere uh, coincides with the focus of the laser. Of course, we are not taking the account of reflections here that will bring it a little bit down. And if you want to do the right calculation, you will have to use uh, wave optics in order to do it uh, properly. Uh, one important thing about the optical tweezer is that the amount of force in the z direction, the axial directions, depends on the numerical aperture of your beam. If you do have a low numerical aperture beam, you can trap in two dimensions, but you cannot actually trap in the z dimension, z direction. So the, they are called uh, false traps. And sometimes it's harder because if you have a particle that's just uh, uh, holding on the surface of the glass, you can trap and change it in the transversal direction, but you have to show that you are able to actually lift and lower the particle with the optical tweezers. So only for high numerical aperture beams, you have enough force in the z-direction to actually capture the particles. And that's important when you wanted to use it with biology. That was the move that was not played. This is the best test for the good optical tweezers. I call it sperm test. Take a spermatozoid, it's a champion of the microorganism. With the tail, it's about 50 microns. 
it can generate force as high as 50 piconewtons. And so some of the awkward reasons that they just use these uh, diode lasers, low power diode lasers, the force you can generate, they go less than 10 piconewtons. If you try to actually trap something like this that has its own energy, it's going to escape through the direction of the lowest force. So all your awkward reason is good enough or you're not going to be able to actually trap microorganisms and keep them whatever they try to do. It's trying to escape, but it's not able to escape. You can see it. And the other thing I would like to use this idea is just get the dipole and think that as soon as your dipole vibrates, it's just uh, emit radiation on this kind of pattern. And if you do this, and remember that in a mass spring into resonance, if you go above the resonance with higher frequency, it just do not move. So the amplitude goes with one over the square of the frequency here. But if you go to the lower part of the frequency, it just moves like the constant, normal constant spring. So just the amplitude is just the force divided by k. And by look at this, you can see that if you have a molecule here, the electrons, they have a very small mass, so the frequency, the resonance frequency of the electron is very high, usually all the way in the UV region, but the resonance frequency of uh, the nuclei, uh, it's a very low frequency. Uh, for hydrogen, it goes all the way to 2.7 microns, so in the optical region of the uh, visible and infrared, molecules cannot answer to any of these uh, Left magnetic fields here. Uh, so the usual situation we have is that the electron can answer to the laser, but the nucleus cannot answer to those lasers. And if you think about that and make, let's just do like this one here. Uh, the nucleus can vibrate with their own frequency by itself, with thermal vibrations here, and the electron have the same frequency of the laser. And then you take a, a halo expansion of that, and then you look at each term. And this usually goes to zero because the molecule does not have any permanent dipole moments here. And the first one is proportional just to the nuclear coordinate. The second one is proportional to the electron coordinate. That's proportional to the left field. Uh, and then you kind of have to take the second order terms. So you have here the second derivative with respect to the nucleus the mixed derivative between the nucleus and the electron, and the second derivative with respect to the electrons, and then you go to third orders and fourth order and so on. Usually, when you take in terms of uh, nonlinear optics for Kepler, they talk in orders about the left field. And because only the electron can answer to uh, a left field, this thing here for them is this is the first order, this is the first order term, that's the one one, and this is the second order, and this is order zero, because it just involves the nuclear coordinates here. So in terms of this expansion, some of these terms that in Taylor series is going to be higher order, for this kind of nonlinear optic expansion, it's going to be a lower order here. And the nice thing about that is that then you can extract all the nonlinear optics that we can use. For example, the first one with respect to the electron is just proportional to the electric field here. That's just the absorption of the electron levels. And that's the one that we use to excite fluorescence with just one photon. These are quantum dots we make at Unicamp here. They are just in fluorescent different colors. These are carbon colorized quantum dots. And here are some of our images here by just using normal fluorescence here. If you, if you go to the derivative with respect to the nucleus, you can have infrared absorption. That's not so useful because it goes all the way to the infrared, so water starts to absorb everything in biology and water is always present there. So it's going to be tough to do this thing. And then you're going to have the first orthoton of the infrared absorption, and this can go to the near infrared region, 
And the second, and there is overtone here of the infrared absorption, that they become weaker and weaker and weaker. Although people use this as an analytical tool of uh, understanding the near infrared region. Uh, for the linear optics here, you can have, first one is just the absorption, the all, the, if you do not, do not have any electronic level here, you can just have relic scattering here. And if you do have two vibrational levels here, and you mix the nucleus with the electron, and then you can have the laser minus the nucleus uh, frequency, that's the Stokes drama, and you can add the laser in the uh, nucleus vibration, then you're going to have the drama one, uh, un Stokes drama here. Usually, you have more population on this level than on that level, so this signal is higher than this signal one. And if you want to measure the temperature, if you can, if you are able to measure the Stokes and un Stokes signals, drama signals, you can measure the temperature remotely, which can be an important uh, uh, information for biologists. Uh, if you just mix two, elect two electron fields, and then you have two electric fields here, you can just add two frequencies. I put them different, but you can make them equal, J and K here. So you can make the sun frequency generation. If you make all of them the same, you have the second one generation, and you can also generate the difference between these frequencies. That's just with the term that is the second derivative respect to the electron coordinate. Uh, of course, you can now mix two nuclear coordinate with one electron, and then you can have the first overtone with wrong spectrum, or you can add two electrons and one nucleus, and this is called hyperwarm. Uh, spectrum here, or you can have two electrons and one nucleus for, you can have the Stokes one and the other Stokes hyperwarm spectrum as well. Third order, you can have three photons, generate just one photon, there's just three electron terms here. You can mix them with the nuclear coordinates, and then if you mix them with the right uh, wavelengths, you can then generate cars microscopy. So we start with this one here, the other photon brings it down to the other vibration level, one up, and then the signal is generated from this one. And the Stokes cars, this cars is unstokes from scattering, this is Stokes from scattering, it starts from the upper level. So the signal here is actually more intense than the signal of the uh, Stokes from scattering there. So you can use all these linear and nonlinear optical process in order to make images. And if you do have a linear process here, the number of events, it depends on just your intensity of your field, and so the number of events is the intensity multiplied by the area. So you have power by the area, multiplied by the area, you have just proportional to the power. That means that in the same layers here, although the area is larger, you have the same number of events here. So if you have just fluorescence, it's like by one photon, you're going to have fluorescence from this layer, that layer, from the focal spot, and from the other layers. And if you do have two photons and other ones, so you're going to have now proportional to the A-square, and so there is still one area at the denominator, and this area means that the second, the signal generator, the focal spot, is going to be much larger than the signal generator. If you do not have anything that depends on your intensity here more than the first power, it's going to be just like that. And so the other way to look at this is that now you have a chemical reaction, make one photon and change it into electro excited, and the volume of this reaction just proportional to the concentration of photons, that in our case is the intensity. And for nonlinear optics with any photon process, you need any photons to generate one electron, so it's going to be proportional to the intensity to the end power of the photon. There, and so you have seen this picture probably a thousand times here. Or oh, you have a pulsed laser here, you are just generating uh, fluorescence from this spot, 
and the CW laser, you generate the whole cone of light there. And so if you wanted to just get the light from the focal spot, you have to reject the light generated at the other uh, uh, height there. And of course, you need pulsar lasers in order to do uh, nonlinear optics. The first way to think about and to explain to biologists is just to say that the chance for this event to happen depends on the number of photons. If the photons will coincide in time and space, if they they come from a CW laser, they are spread all over the time. So the chance for two photons to coincide in time is very low. So if instead of using a CW laser, just use a pulsed laser, you put all the faults in the same time. So the chance for this event to happen uh, increases a lot. Or, and then, then the second one is at the focal spot. The focal spot, you have the lights are much closer from each other, so the chance that they will overlap in space is going to be much higher. And of course, if you, you can take the peak power of your laser, like the energy per pulse, divided by the duration, and the average power is the energy of pulse by the ref rate of your thing. So you have this connection between the peak power and the average power, which means that if you have normal ref rate of uh, pi sapphire laser, like 10 nanoseconds, 12 nanoseconds, that's 10 nanoseconds is good enough, and the uh, pulse width of 100 femtoseconds, for an average power of 1 watt, you're going to have a peak power of 10 to 5 watts, which can generate lots of linear signal without uh, too much heat into your sample. And of course, the nonlinear signal, the number of events that pulse depends on the, uh, for uh, any other nonlinear optics, depends on this multiplied by the duration of your pulse, and you will have to add the, all of them. And if you have to add all of them, you're going to have the A here, you're going to have one A over here, so it's N minus 1 here. You're going to have this tau here and the other tau there, so you're going to have T tau to power N minus 1, and you're going to add on the number of pulse, which is the integration time divided by the ref rate, and so and this is the energy per pulse uh, power to N. So you end up that everything goes with the uh, pulse width to N minus 1 and the integration time here, the average power to the power n and the inverse of the area to the power n minus 1. So the signal of two photons goes with 1 over uh, pulse width for 3 photons of the square of pulse width and 4 photons of the pulse width to 10 power. And you do have to take care about the damage. You can have two kinds of damage to your sample. Thermal ones that is go proportional to the average power, but you also have hot or breakdown. Your electric field is so high that it can uh, uh, ionize all your electrons there, and this goes proportional to the peak power. So at some point, <coughs> you cannot increase your laser at your sample because you're going to damage it. That means that if you cannot increase your laser power at the sample uh, as you wish, you will have to be very careful to not lose much generated photons, to collect all of them in the most efficient way, to avoid thermal damage or optical photo damage to your sample. So let's go now, let's come now to a little bit discussion of the instrumentation. So first source confocal microscopy. Uh, the patents belongs to Marvin Minsk, the father of artificial intelligence. The patents is before the laser. He actually did demonstrate. And so his idea was to improve the axial resolution of the microscope. And for that idea, he just used, uh, if he wanted to make an image in this way, he put a pinhole here. In such a way, this, this, these two points are conjugated image planes here. And any image that comes from other uh, Z position, it's going to open at the aperture. It's going to be rejected at the aperture. So it, this way, he, he tried to do this. Actually, he invented this. He did show this back in the 60s with even uh, not laser, with lamps. But the first commercial 
confocal microscopy was sold something like in 1988 or 1989. And they actually choose the people that who could buy this first ones. And the, the first image of the confocal microscopy they use to move the sample around. And it's the images were just terrible. It only became a successful commercial problem when they start to scan the laser and not the sample. And the idea to scan the laser is that you can bring any ray here that passes at the center of the laser, it does not, does, not, does not bend here, and goes to the same focal plane. So just by tilting the laser, you can scan it. But there is one point here, you cannot tilt it anyway, because if you tilt it just like that, it's going to be a loss at the aperture of your objective. So you are going to have to uh, tilt it around this axis here in the interest of your objective. And the way to do that is just put a lens here with your focal spot, focal distance right at that mirror, and another one here. So as soon as you change this, this goes parallel and back to this point here. So you translate the movement from this scanning mirror here to the movement of that position over there. With that, you do not lose power by doing the scanning of your laser light. And to control the zero ratio, yeah, I, I call this telescope, and some people in science, they used to call it collimator. You, if you just put two lenses at the same focal distance with the one at the focus of the other one, if the beam comes parallel, it goes out parallel. If you move the lens this way, it tends to focus there. So the beam goes down, and if you move to the other direction, the, your beam is going to be white. So you can control them just by moving one lens with respect to the other, uh, your height at the microscope. So what we do usually, uh, the CW ones, they have to... If you try to do this with a CW laser, it's nice, but the point is that as soon as you move your laser, your image is going to be here and not at the uh, pinhole. So it moves sideways. So in order to make sure that your uh, collection light is always going to be at your pinhole, you need to descan the system. Uh, so the idea is that the light goes back into the same pathway that it goes forward and it comes very quickly here. So as soon as you scan, bring the fluorescence back there. As soon as you pass through those two scanning mirrors, so it's in the same position. And then you need a light right here in order to let the fluorescence pass through, but not the laser. So you have to block the laser. And then you have the pin hold, and then you put a filter to block the laser, it's still block, and then you can detect as a function of the position that you have there. So, and then back in 1994, you see what W. Webb is the World Wide Web himself. Mm -hmm. He invented this idea of multifold microscopy. That was the time when the Thai Sapphire was a very kind of commercial one. And so he said, if I just generate the light at the focal spot, I do not need to pass through all these discerning detection techniques. I can just put the detector wherever I want and detect as much light as I can. So he could get rid of his cavern here and detect much more photons than the usual way. And you can put these detectors in whatever place you want. So that's an example of non discerning detector. Here you have two, three, four non discerning detectors. And if this uh, is an inverted microscope, your laser is coming from this side, and then this is back reflected to the non discerning detectors. But you can also put non discerning detectors on the transmitted light forward pass of your light. And you can have as much as almost 11 of this non discerning detector. And if you wanted to integrate all these optical techniques, one very important property of light is that optical beams do not collapse, except for the Star Wars movie, that you can stop one light beam with the other sword, light sword. Uh, the fact is that if it would be a real fight, all of them would be dead in a matter of seconds. Uh, so let's try to see the optical sequence where we can combine our lasers uh, for the excitation and then for the detections. So I'm now taking 
the idea of the microscope I already have, that's, uh, I, I, had, I used to have an Olympus one, and now I bought a size one. So you have this gun head here. We want to do, at the same time, multi-photo and single photo. You, you do have a Tyson Farley's that is tunable, but each time it has only one wavelength. So if you wanted to excite more than one fluorescence at the same time, you need all the lasers. And I don't think you will want to buy four or five Tyson Farley lasers to do that. So usually you use CW lasers together with the Tyson Farley laser. The CW lasers you can couple with optical fibers into your microscope, that's the most easy way to do, and you usually get something like four or five CW lasers. So you always would have this. It's uh, the price of this is almost for free compared to the price of that. So you, so you put as, as many as you can, and of course today uh, I would like to only have diode lasers here. You can go for 400, 405 nanometers all the way to 700 nanometers, and they can be posted in picosecond time scale, which is nice to do flim. So, and then, you are only the pulsed lasers. I just put this kind of region here because I do not want to tell which one exactly. One. You will have to couple into your scan head and combine with those lasers as well. And for these lasers, you don't want to use fibers. Fibers will spread your pulse and you're going to lose pulse width. And then, optical tweezers, you're going to bring from the sideways. The first thing, the before your object here. So from the terms of your laser, the way to combine nonlinear laser with the CW laser is very important here. Yeah. Uh, we do have filters, dichroic filters, ready for uh, confocal normal confocal microscopes. And they do have this, they will reflect the excitation laser and they will let the fluorescence to pass through. But the point is that you never will have a filter that can go all the way from 690 to 1000 nanometer. That's the one that you use for the Thai sapphire. So, but you do have filters like this. If you go to see at center of here, you can have a filter that can pass everything from 300 to almost 700, or you can then reflect everything from 6700 to more than 1000 or the other way around. So you can use one as optical filtering and the other one to reflect that. And so in order to combine them, what you do is that you first use the dichroic, like this one, the commercial one, for your OEL CW lasers, and you have a filter here, here that you can change, and then you use a filter like this to combine with your Tesla fire here. Okay, so this filter is going to let all the fluorescence pass through, and it's going to let all the lasers be transmitted to. The only thing that he is going to do is to reflect your nonlinear lasers. So you can combine them right in front of the scan head system, like the one that I have here. You put all the CW lasers on this spot. Each one of these is just a collimator, so you can compute and control it. And then the nonlinear actually it comes from this spot, but for the drawing purpose, it's much better to use this port here. And so you have the filter view here for the nonlinear lasers and the other one for the CW laser. So then the laser is going to go to the microscope and the fluorescence is going to come back here and the pinhole is at that point, six step. So this way you can combine them. Now, what about if you wanted to use scarves and multi-photo microscope at the same time. So now, I do have the system of two OPOs. I just put one of them. The idea here is the following. First, to use cars, you have to put all the pulses in time, so you have to synchronize them, so you make a delay line for each one of them. You can combine with the fundamental of the pump laser. What's an OPO? OPO is optical parametric oscillator. It's a system that you, one photon, generate two, that the energy must be the same. And if they, they, you have just enough power, it's going to be called optical parametric amplifier. If it pass just one or twice through your crystal, and if you put it inside a cavity, it's going to be feedbacked there. 
and that's called, called optical parameter oscillator. And you do change the wavelength by changing the temperature of your crystal. So it can generate any wavelength as long as the energy of the two photons add up to the energy of the point laser. And so in my case, I have uh, neutinium vanadat that is doubled. So I pump this with 532. And with 532, I can generate one with the higher energy is called signal, and the other one is called idle. So they come with the same time, they are synchronized in time. But you do make this delay line because sometimes the pathway is different and because you want to have freedom to actually, even though if they come out with the same time here, after they pass through all the optics, they have different wavelengths. So they're going to be defaced in time. So you have to correct for that. So you need all this uh, translation stage here in order to correct for the timing. And you also need the telescope for each one of them in order to make them to coincide together with the Thai sapphire and the CW lasers that are at the focus of your microscope. And then, and then the idea here, you have your Thai sapphire laser, you have a attenuator for it. They usually use this uh, acoustic filter. I just discovered that they are terrible. They use a lot of power. I would use the other way. I just use a half wave pellet and the polarizer here. And then we need to combine this that can be tuned from 690 all the way to 1040 nanometers with this one here that the signal can be tuned from 690 all the way to 99 nanometers. So they are in the same range. So the way to combine them and to be wavelength insensitive is just to use the following. Put here a polarizer beam splitter and let with the same polarization of your Tysapar laser, so 100% of your Tysapar laser is going to pass through, and this other one here, if it's going to be in the other polarization, it's going to be reflected. And because you have used a half wave plate here, you can control the power of these lasers and mix them together with the Tysapar laser. Uh, wavelength is just to have to use a broadband here, polarizer beam split. Five more minutes. Okay. So here are the lasers, the pump lasers, and the auto tweezers is going to come right at this spot here. Uh, and for that, we have this kind of filter that will only reflect 1064. And everything from the Thai Sapphire laser all the way to the visible laser is going to pass through. And even you can go to 1.5 microns. That's going to pass through. So with this, you can combine with the optical tweezers. In my case, I promised the biologist to buy a commercial system. It's not like the one that uh, Ivan was showing here. The idea is just to split the lights in two arms. You have two telescopes here, so you can control the height by these two telescopes, but you do have here a very fast scanning mirror. So the idea is to make a point like here, and then you stop, make that, there, there, so fast that the particle will actually see a uh, average power there. It's time shared here. But if you change this height here, so you can have 10 optical tweezers point here, 10 optical tweezers point here, you can move them this way, but you cannot move this one with respect to the other one in the z direction but you can move in any plane that you want. And this is when we buy, it comes also with a UV laser for micro dissections. Okay, so I think I will stop at this detection circuit here and continue from that point. Any uh, questions on the first part of the process? One quick one. You, you mentioned that uh, one can measure temperature uh, locally in a sample. Um, what kind of spatial resolution could you have for temperature measure? It's uh, spatial resolution. If you, for example, use uh, confocal Raman, you can have the same spatial resolution of confocal Raman, which would be something like 400 nanometer in the axial, in the transverse direction. For 600 nanometers in the 
axial direction. The question is, what's the temperature we can measure? So if you can measure only sensitivity for 10 or more degrees, it does not matter for biology. So for biology, we need something that can measure temperature of order of 2 degrees. So you can try to use this. You can try to use the call fluorescence correlation spectroscopy that depends on the uh, diffusion of your molecule that depends on temperature. The content is that depends on the other coefficients as well, so you have to make play tricks in order to extract temperature. Or you can use... It's nice because it does not depend on the efficiency of fluorescence, but you do use fluorescence, which is a strong signal. Or you can use some molecule, fluorescence molecules as well. So all of them, it seems to be in the order of one degree. So some of them can go to half a degree, but we see spatial resolution comparable to the same that you use for microscopy. But the point is a non-contact technique. So if something happens into your cell and something heat is delivered, then... I, I would think it's very useful to look at a biological process and know <coughs> the temperature and the heat gradients within the, within the tissue if that's possible. Any more questions? Just a question. Are there different temperatures in the same cell? Do you measure different temperatures within the same cell? Yeah. That's the idea. Because you do have lots of uh, ATP burning at some special locations inside of your cell. So. And what's the difference in temperature? I do not know exactly. Uh, I just was asking this question about a week ago. This biologist came to me and asked me, can you measure the temperature? And then I start to look around and I discover I can. The point is that, is this useful for him? So I don't know yet. And so I look at the literature and see what kind of... And then I start, the first thing I start to think about was ground. But then, with the amount of noise, the temperature of period cells usually they tend to stay at 38 degrees, 37 degrees. So the change in temperature, how much, how sensitive can I measure the temperature with Stokes and then Stokes run? I know that if I want to measure 100 degrees, it's very easy. But if I want to measure one degree. Well, I don't know yet. Thank you. Okay, let's take a quick break, uh, just 15 minutes, and then we'll come back for part two.